It was their belief in the annual journey of their God that Elijah alluded to there in his conflict with those priests of Baal on Mount Carmel. And that was the Syrophoenician sun god. You remember in 1 Kings 18.27, it says, If he is a god, either he's on a journey or per adventure, he sleepeth and must be awakened. All right, now listen. Tammuz was hailed as the son of the sun because he was born to Semiramis after her husband died and supposedly went to dwell in the sun. And she claimed that her pregnancy was due to being impregnated by uh, by her husband, and that the son now being born to her was the son of the S-U-N. And that son was idolized and even worshipped. The first letter of his name became, in time, the symbol of sun worship. Human sacrifices to the sun god were offered on this initial letter made of wood known as the cross T. His birthday, December 25, was honored more and more. When Thomas died, the pagans instituted 40 days of weeping for him before the full moon following the vernal equinox. Now think of it, friends. Satan worked many years before the conception and birth of the true Messiah, Jesus, to counterfeit through sun worship his miraculous conception and birth. Now let's read about this very thing in the Bible. Perhaps some of you never knew that the Bible even mentions this. But I'm reading now from Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 12 to 18. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, The Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. He said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, and they worshipped the sun toward the east. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence, and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. Now, friends, God's people were constantly coming in contact with paganism, which was nothing more or less than sun worship. They were constantly being tempted to follow the religion of the pagans instead of the Bible. Satan succeeded many times in leading God's people into sin and pagan sun worship. The prophet was shown greater and still greater abominations. He was shown the people turning their backs on the temple of God and worshiping the sun toward the east. They also worship the moon goddess, Semiramis, the so-called queen of heaven. Let me read you what they did in Jeremiah 7, 16 to 18. Therefore pray not thou for this people, neither lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods, that they may provoke me to anger. Now, friends, these cakes were round, and on them was cut a cross in honor of the sun god, and they were offered to the queen of heaven. And today they're called hot cross buns. Now, let's notice a few striking and outstanding things that took place. And keep in mind that the devil, who is really the author of pagan sun worship, had been working for centuries to get this false worship so implanted in the world that God's true plan of salvation through Jesus Christ would be insulted and, if possible, be made a failure. Now, first, the exact date of Christ's birthday was not really known. And so it was suggested... Why not call it the same date as the birth of Tammuz, which was December 25? And uh, that, too, was the time when the sun had reached its lowest point on the horizon and started back up in the heavens. The sun god had come to life, so to speak. 
Thus, gradually but surely, December 25 came to be known as the birthday of Christ. The papal church finally instituted a special mass on that day, Christ Mass. And so December 25 became Christ Mass, taken from Christ Mass. The Yule Tog, Yule Log, rather, burning in the fire, followed by the green tree lighted with candles, all came in from the pagan's worship, representing Nimrod's being dead, while his spirit still lived in the sun, and was alive again in Tammuz, his son. Again, Christ was crucified and resurrected in the spring of the year, near the time of the moon festival. The devil was on hand again to bring in the idea of having a celebration the same time as the heathen, and even doing as they did, but calling it in honor of the resurrection. The cakes to the queen of heaven became the hot cross buns. You read that now in Jeremiah 7, 16 to 18. The 40 days of, quote, weeping for Tammuz in Ezekiel 8, 12 and 18 became Lent. And at the close of Lent came Easter Sunday. As I've already mentioned, this goddess Easter came to be known as the goddess of springtime. New life, or as history records it, the goddess of reproduction. The pagans went out to some mountainside early Sunday morning and worshipped this goddess as the sun was rising in the east. They gave themselves to immorality and indecency of every description. The eggs and rabbits were used as symbols of fertility and, of course, germination of life, life principle. Now, friends, are you following what I'm saying? How many of these pagan ideas came in to the early celebrations back there in the early Christian church? Now, friends, listen, what an insult that was to our Lord and Savior Jesus. Because he arose from the dead or came to life early Sunday morning, Satan succeeded in transferring the insulting festival to the pagans over in honor of Christ's resurrection. And so today we still have the bunny rabbits and, and Easter eggs, or Easter eggs, as they really should be called, in honor of the, of the Easter goddess of the sun or uh, goddess of uh, reproduction, rather. And we have the hot cross buns, the early sunrise service, all being put forth in honor of Christ's resurrection. And yet it all came into the church gradually and was blessed by the church and given to the world. Uh, well, friends, our time has slipped by today, but we'll continue our series in the next broadcast. And please don't miss the next link in this chain, but, chain because I'll be talking about one of the most breathtaking arrogant deceptions that Satan ever devised and how he used it to try to humiliate the Son of God. And now this is Joe Cruz saying goodbye for today. After a victorious campaign, Alexander the Great crucified over 10,000 human beings to celebrate his victory. I'll return in a moment with the amazing facts about the sacrifices of Satan. Hello, this is Joe Cruz on the Amazing Facts broadcast, facts which affect you. Today we come to the climax of our series on paganism and the church, and the subject today is centered in the symbol of the cross. Although the cross has become a revered relic and often even an object of worship, I'd like to explore the ancient background of this cherished symbol. In our last broadcast, we discovered that the Bible describes the worship of Tammuz, the pagan god of the sun. Satan inspired those idolatrous people to represent Tammuz by the letter T, the first letter of his name. It came to be a worldwide symbol of sun worship and all the moral pollutions attached to that kind of worship. The heathen actually sacrificed human beings to the devil on crosses. Centuries before Jesus was born, crucifixion was a method of worshiping the pagan sun god. When sun-worshipping generals went to battle, they offered thousands of human sacrifices to the devil. It's said that Alexander the Great, after a victorious campaign, crucified over 10,000 human beings on the cross to celebrate his victory. 3,000 chief Babylonians were crucified at one time as a sacrifice to the devil. 
When the Catholics first went down into South America and Mexico, soon after they were discovered, they were amazed to find that the sun-worshiping heathen there had crosses. They were amazed because they did not know that they knew anything about crosses. They didn't know anything about Christianity, but they had crosses because they were the sign of Tammuz, the sun god. But listen, friends, the time finally came for the Son of God to be born. The exact day of his birth, of course, nobody knows, but he lived to be 33 and a half years when he was crucified, which was in the spring of the year at the time of the Passover. Now listen, it's almost too terrible for words. You remember Tammuz was exalted by Satan to be the false Messiah, a rival of Jesus. The symbol of the cross, the first letter of his name, T, was the sign of sun worship. Down through the years, many times, as Satan had succeeded in leading Israel into sin and pagan sun worship, it had seemed that the sun god was victorious over the true god. Jesus, the creator of the world, came into a world that had forgotten him. He suffered every insult at its hands and finally died upon the symbol of sun worship, the cross, as Paul says, even the death of the cross. Now, in order to show that his system of worship was superior to that of God's and to show his supremacy, Satan heaped the supreme insult upon Christ by crucifying him upon the cross, the symbol of sun worship. Think of the Son of God dying in such awful humiliation while the people looked on in derision. What mockery and what rejoicing then by the demons. The Son of God delivered by His own people and crucified by the sun-worshipping Romans on the symbol of sun-worship. Think of the great Son of God dying in such awful humiliation while the people looked on wagging their heads in mockery. But Satan saw that his disguise was torn away. His administration was laid open before the unfallen angels and before the heavenly universe. He had revealed himself as a murderer. The last link of sympathy was broken. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Revelation 12, verse 10. Yet Satan was not then destroyed. For the sake of man, his existence must be continued. Man, as well as angels, must see the contrast between the prince of light and the prince of darkness. He must choose whom he will serve. Now, as we look at Calvary, what do we see? We see the author of life with his form stripped of all its clothing. He is hung before the sun on the symbol of the cross, the cross that was once the symbol of heathen worship and heathen pollution. And on that Friday afternoon, the sun was darkened. God placed his hand over the sun while Christ hung upon the cross. Now, blackening the sun by God's hand was not just an incidental thing. It had some significance to it. There was a reason why that sun was darkened. You see, that sun to the heathen was a symbol of the devil, our sun god. So God placed his hand over the sun to show that he controlled the sun. God said, that's as far as you can go. God darkened the sun to prove he was the creator and had power over these things. But now, let's answer a most important question, friends. Do you know why Jesus came forth from the tomb before daybreak on that Sunday morning? According to all the background I've given, you must realize that at sunrise on the first day of the week, men would be worshiping the sun or the devil while Jesus Christ would be in the tomb. Yes, at sunrise, Satan would be worshiped. It's Friday night. The moments are tense. Now, to be sure of his victim, mind you, the devil had the tomb of Jesus sealed with a seal. Now, do you know what the name of that seal was? It's called the Roman seal. But in Latin, the name was Singlum Solas, which in Latin means the seal of the sun. So on that tomb of Jesus Christ, they placed Singlum Solas, the seal of the sun god. And the devil thought he had his victim there to stay. He sealed him with the seal of the sun. But on the first day of the week, it was revealed before daylight just who was superior. Christ rested in his tomb on the, as the Sabbath passed on. He knew that sun worshipers everywhere, the moment the sun would rise, would worship Satan. But before the rising of the sun, when the stone is still in place, and there are over a hundred Roman guards on watch, together with a host of evil angels and Satan, something happens. 
There are other visitors there also, angels that excel in strength were there to welcome the Prince of Life. 